The ASP.NET 3.5 extensions were a bundle that was released in December of 2007, and it put all these things together. And uh, Microsoft is doing kind of a mediocre job, seriously, turn that off, uh, <laughs> of, of explaining exactly the direction that we're going. So one of the things that I'm going to try to do uh, while I work at Microsoft is getting, giving people a general idea of direction. It's getting a little sloppy because it feels a little bit like 2008 came out, and now just as we're supposed to get used to that, here's a whole bunch of new stuff. And they'll call it Preview Future CTP, right? And people's brains explode because it's too much information. But all of this stuff, which is bundled in this ASP.NET 3.5 extensions that came out in December, is going to be in a, in, a, in a coming service pack that you'll be able to download and it'll just it'll work. It'll be an update. So, ADO.NET Data Services is, in, is a new uh, thing that's going to sit on top of either Link to SQL or Link to uh, Link's Entities. And I'm going to show, I'm going to spend more time in the demos and less time in the slides explaining that to you. And, uh, and then dynamic data is going to make ASP.NET development a lot easier. This is going to be stuff that you're going to be able to get a hold of this year. You can certainly you know, you'll get the previews. I'll be showing you uh, daily builds that are on my machine in the virtual in a, in a VM. And uh, since we have such a small crowd here, I would encourage you guys to interrupt me and ask questions because I want to make sure that you get like what this is for and why this is useful. Because it sounds like you, you maybe all of you, most of you maybe work for like corporations that move a little slower and are, are not necessarily on the latest stuff, <coughs> but it's good to know about what's coming down so you can uh, get an idea of whether you should wait or not and whether it's going to be baked. But let's do a little bit of context for a second because it can be really confusing. I assume that everyone here uh, has explained to their boss how .NET 3.5 isn't really a new version of the .NET framework, it's just kind of something else, but the marketing people drew a box around it, but I'm just going to go through that real quick to make sure you guys understand. So we know that we know we all understand what .NET 2.0 was, because I'm assuming that most of us were around when 1.1 and 2.0 made that transition, right? And we understand, okay, new CLR, cool, I get that. New compiler, new base class library, that made sense to us. And there was a little bit of uncomfortableness for a while where we were asking ourselves which version of the CLR is running in this process, right? We remember that time. But for the most part, we get this. Now things go horribly wrong at this point. Because when this name came out, people got confused. They said 3.0. And we had all remembered the 1.0 to 2.0 transition, and we immediately said, okay, all new stuff, all new compilers, all new stuff. none of that really happened. It was a marketing thing where someone drew a dotted line and pointed and said, that's 3.0. It's, you know, it's one better than two. And that's why they called it that. But what is encapsulated within 3.0 are these technologies, the W question mark F stack. <laughs> WCF, WPF, so you've got presentation foundation, communications, you've got workflow, and then card space. But the CLR didn't rev here. There was a service pack and stuff to make things supported. To, you know, so you, you, to have 3.0, you needed 2.0 service pack 1. But for the most part, this was a confusing marketing thing. So then, we do this. At this point, you're completely <laughs> confused, and then you're trying to sell your boss on .NET, but they still don't quite understand what is this going to do to my machine? So one of the things that I'm trying to encourage folks at Microsoft to do is to add either in a readme or in a blog or something to say, should I fear this release? Because that's what I asked myself when I, I, mean, I didn't work for Microsoft for 15 years before I went to work for the, for the man. And uh, I've been there six months. And I still get software and I go, okay, is this the last MSI I'm ever going to install? <laughs> Is this the MSI that I'm going to hear about later when I launch Outlook? And then suddenly that MSI starts running and saying, I'm trying to reinstall Visual Studio. And then I get to, uh, I to pay, right? So should you fear these releases? It's a really important thing you should ask yourself. And I'm going to try to encourage folks to, uh, to, at Microsoft to express that. So I'm going to explain to you, if you go and download these previews, what it's going to do to your machine so you won't have to necessarily be afraid if it's going to screw something up. And I think that if Microsoft had done a better job, of explaining this progression between 2.0 and 3.0 and 3.5, maybe more people would be less afraid of putting these things on their boxes. You can put 3.0 and 3.5 on your box without screwing up your 2.0 application. You can put 2008 on your boxes. And on the other hand, some very, very minimal edge cases in the 2.0 service pack one, all your 2.0 stuff continues to run just fine. .NET 3.5 adds new compilers, enables link, but the CLR underneath remains largely unchanged. And I think if more people realized that, that would be cool. So 3.5 adds link, 
It adds the rest, rest support. Rest is representational state transfer. Who's doing anything with, um, let's just start here. We'll, we'll, I'm going to raise hands and then we'll lower them as we don't do stuff. So who's doing stuff with angle brackets? Truly, you can angle brackets, HTML, XML. Come on, help me out here. <laughs> Ladies, surely you're doing something with markup in some way. No? <coughs> XML? Okay. So uh, who is making web services such that I make a call in the browser or with an application and then angle brackets come back? Keep your hands up. If you're not doing that, put your hands down. Okay? Now, are you doing that with web services? Keep web, web hands up, only web services. Web services? When we say web services, you're thinking Azimax? Okay? You want to WCF? WCF people? Okay. Who's doing REST? Exactly. One guy. What are you doing with REST? Uh, we're a publisher, so we're doing access to documents. Okay. Now, are you doing it where I type something in the URL and Absolutely. angle brackets come back? So it is my URL slash ABC123. And then XML comes back. Exactly. And can I post XML to you and put stuff in the database? You can, but it's on the private uh, interface because okay. we don't allow and, the public and to do And what's the that. verb that I use when I do that? Uh, it is post. It is get. So us. you do get to get stuff. Yes. Post to post update. To post stuff. Post you do put and delete. Uh, no puts, no deletes, because it is things that stay permanent and then okay. get replaced. Okay. So most people who are doing stuff where you type in a URL or you make a request to a web server and an angle brackets come back, are doing REST, which is a formalized way of <coughs> thinking about the, about uh, information on the internet that we're going to talk about. They're doing POX. So I wanted to see if you were doing POX. POX is plain old XML, all right? <laughs> they think we're doing, hey, we're doing web services, woohoo! And they're doing just plain old XML. And I have found, uh, at, at working at large companies, it's really, really difficult to, to move information around in angle brackets. I spend all this time changing information from databases <coughs> into objects, into angle brackets, into other objects, and then back into somebody else's database. And I, I call that left-hand, right-hand work, where basically you kind of spend all this time going, in, select node, select node, shove it in an object, shove it in an object, select node, select node. And it's really messy. And I realize, as I'm doing this work, that uh, am I doing work? Like if you just do left hand, right hand work like that, and you transform data from one format to another, are you really doing anything? Or are you just kind of moving stuff around? Like no actual business is occurring. And uh, I worked at a company called Carillion that did um, like JP Morgan Chase and these kind of big companies <coughs> banking systems. So I worked at Chase and uh, Bank One and put together these systems using web services. And Ultimately, though, we just wanted to get some data, update some data, maybe insert a little data, delete data occasionally, and, uh, and web services and WSDL and those things really didn't lend themselves to easily moving that data around. So, so REST is this formalized way to do that. Actually, let me just briefly point out a couple things. Uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but I've got a couple of slides here where I show different uh, things within the bundle of ASP.NET 35 extensions. Like ASP.NET MVC is just three DLLs. And the dynamic data demo that I'll show you in a little bit is really just two. And the data extensions so I'm going to show you are just really three or four DLLs. Really minor changes to your system. So these things shouldn't screw your boxes up. So if you want to play with them, you shouldn't necessarily fear them. OK, so let's talk about data extensions. I'll talk about data extensions, then we'll try to do a demo on dynamic <coughs> data. And that should, that should give you enough information to fill your brain. So ADO.NET data extensions is a way to use HTTP and URIs URI, not URL, right? There's Uniform Resource Locator, and then there's Identifier. We're using resource identifiers to refer to data. And we're using HTTP. Now, we're familiar with GET. This is when you type in a URL, cnn.com, you enter. We're doing a GET underneath. You fill out a form, you hit Submit, and that does a post. Those are, the, those are called HTTP verbs. We're familiar with those verbs. There are others. There's like 23 verbs. But there's four that we could really be using when we refer to data, which is get, post, put, puts it one we really never use, and, and delete. So what REST does is it maps those four verbs, those existing HTTP <coughs> verbs, to CRUD. Remember CRUD? Create, read, update, delete. So gets a read, and post is an update, and put is an insert, and delete is a delete. Okay? So, it, so the REST people, feel really strongly that they've got these verbs, why don't we map them directly? Because 90% of the work they were doing is, is CRUD. This is the work that I was doing <coughs> at my last job, which is pushing data around. But we were writing wisdom manually. We were doing all this work just to take data and put it into angle brackets. We were paying this really intense angle bracket tax. It's very painful. 
Now, we could use rest and return XML. But we can also return JSON. Who's doing AJAX work? JSON is JavaScript object notation. It will make sense when we do the demos. We can bring this data back as, in a JavaScript format, and it's the same exact data. And they've actually unified this addressing scheme. When you see it, you'll see how you can refer to your databases and all the data within it in a very uniform way that makes a lot of sense. And it all happens automatically. So we don't have to go and build web services when we're doing obvious CRUD style work. And it's locked down by default. So by default, <coughs> you're not getting any access to your database. And I'll show you how that security model works. And there are both Silverlight and .NET client libraries that will make it really easy for you to get at this data. So ultimately, at the end, you get link style access to your objects over this REST format. That's a lot of information. Uh, we'll try to explain it just a little bit more in detail and get into the demo. So POX, plain old XML. This is just someone types in a URL and XML. Someone types in a URL and XML comes back. Sometimes you or your bosses might refer to something that's POX and call it web services. Okay, that's not technically the kind of web services that I think about, but it is, uh, it's valid. There's, it's a service and it's over the web. But it's important to note that, that getting plain old XML is different from things like WS star. Some of people call it WS desk star. This is all of those specs, WS this and that, and federation, and routing, and all the complicated things that we thought were going to change the world. Well, oops, that didn't change the world. Uh, REST, sometimes people call these people Restifarians. <laughs> Their programmers usually look like this guy. And when I say Restifarian, they're literally saying that they feel really passionate about this. <coughs> these guys feel strongly about this. The Restifarians and the WF Death Star people fight all the time because each thinks theirs is the one true way. And from my point of view, whichever way works for you, whichever way makes you happy, is, is okay. Interestingly, they are fighting such that, um, from the point of view of the public, which I kind of still consider myself a member of the public because I've only been inside for six months, I want to have options, but some people really want, just tell me how to do it. So there's this balance where it's like, well, I wish Microsoft would just say which way to do it. But at the same time, I want choices because the way that they say isn't necessarily the right way, right? So there are multiple ways to do this. So when I'm showing you this ADO.NET data extension stuff in a moment, showing you this way to do REST, this is not the next great way to do stuff. This is not a replacement for web services. It's a different way to do things. I want people and the public to, to understand that it's okay to have several ways to do something. And I just need to work on making sure that you guys understand why I would pick one over the other. So with REST and with ADO.NET data extensions, we're talking about moving data around over HTTP in formalized ways using either like XML or JavaScript documentation. And you're doing it over HTTP in a formalized way such that create, read, update, delete are mapped to these verbs. This might uh, enable someone who has like a rich client or an AJAX application to much more easily get stuff. If you think about how I'm going to, let's say I'm going to make a, a WPF app right now, and I'm going to fill up a grid. How, how do you do that? Well, you could make a data connection and have the WPF app talk directly to the database. Right? That's one way you could do that. But maybe there were firewall issues, or maybe you can't you know, let people talk over that port directly. How do you get that data? Well, you could make a web service. You could go into Wisdom, you could map it, you could go into Azimax, and you could type, make a new ASP.NET web service, and then you could model this data, you could run it. You know, there's all these ways you do that, but this doesn't really feel comfortable. I just want to get some stuff and put it into a grid. Okay? With something like this, that would enable you to do, to do that. With, 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 um, with REST and with ADO data services, you can just say, I want to get the data out, I'm going to pull it over HTTP. It doesn't obviate, it doesn't obsolete the old fashioned way. The other way, it doesn't mean that all applications should switch over to this, but it means that this is a scenario that people care about. Does that make sense? And feel free, you guys aren't talking back. Do interrupt. But why would you choose this over other methods? What would be the reason? So if uh, I'm writing a, a fat client or I'm writing an ASP.NET application that talks AJAX, and it says, why would you do this? Why would you want to do this over another thing? So, I mean, there's all these different, <coughs> different reasons about, you know, do I, how, how much do I care about security? What kind of security? Do I need you know, certificate-based security? Do I need policy at the, at the enterprise governance level? Do I need you know, uh, complicated routing that goes from, you know, through multiple machines? 
how, you know, how much is this going to be exposed, how much data to what clients, how much control do I want. Maybe I would want to go with WS Star. <coughs> Maybe I want really fine-grained control. I've got federal regulations that are requiring certain levels of security. I've got certificate-based uh, authentication schemes. Maybe I would want to go with WS Star. If I want to interoperate uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a specific WS Dash I, familiar with the data web services interoperability organization, WS-I.org. If I want to say um, I have a WSI compliant web service, then I would want to use the WS stack. But from a pragmatic perspective, and this is when the WS star people who are thinking about words like governance and the, the rest of Farians are saying, hey man, I just want my data. So if you're thinking, hey man, I just want my data, then maybe you would think about West. If you're doing primarily CRUD, if SSL or some basic um, uh, encryption would, would cover it for you. If, if this is public data, if it's books, uh, maybe you would just use it this way. Does that give you more insight? Okay. So let's do this. So we're going to go and make a new project. And I'll just make a web application. And uh, I'm going to, this is just a standard web application so far. I'm going to go into the properties and I'm going to make this uh, run over port 1325, which is just a well-known port. All my other things are, are linked up to this particular uh, port. Ordinarily, you know, you get a uh, an auto-assigned port when you're doing Visual Studio. I'm just going to set this to 1325, so just remember that number for a second. Okay? There's nothing specific about that number within the context of the demo we're asking. I'm just picking a number. And then we're going to go and make a new series of link to SQL classes. Click under data, we'll say link to SQL. And I'm going to say Northwind. The only database existing. Because really, technically, products and categories, what else do you want, right? I mean, <laughs> at an enterprise level, surely you don't need anything other than Northwind database. No, I'm doing it for, for speed. All right. I think I'll maybe I'll go in a little more detail than I, than I ordinarily would because it sounds like you guys aren't deeply familiar with this kind of stuff. Who's using Link to SQL? A couple of folks? Okay. So I just made a new series of Link to SQL classes. And this is going to be a, a pretty, pretty direct mapping from the database to my classes. <coughs> so if I grab a bunch of tables and drop them in here, there's a very direct relationship here. If you've heard about Link to SQL versus Link to Entities, there's a lot of confusion about which one you would pick. When I'm clicking in here, I'm editing a DBML file. Okay? And this is, a, this is actually an XML file, but underneath, you guys know about that, this button here, right? This is the show all files button. In Visual Studio, that's the don't lie to me button. We want to see what's really going on. So, our DBML files got a layout that keeps track of where stuff's you know, moving around because that's not really pertinent to our data, so that's kept in another place. And then a .cs file. So when I'm editing this in that visual designer and dragging tables over, it's really putting things here in my CS file. The one is just a proxy for the other. So for example, if we If we grab a, uh, another table, order details. <clears throat> In my link to SQL classes, I've automatically received delete, insert, I've received my order detail object. Now, when I say that this is a very, very um, direct relationship to the database, it's very physical in the sense of there is a customer's table, and now I have a customer object. In link to entities, that breaks that. So there's, there's two different options here. You could use either of these. Link to SQL is very physical. There's some mapping you can do, but for the most part, it's, it's pretty much with the way it is. This is a product database, this, so I got a product. Link to entities is a full kind of object relational mapper where I could say, well, I want a product object, but it really lives in these three tables. So from the point of view of the developer, there is an entity called product. From the point of view of the database developer, there are these three tables. 
um, you know, that, have, that have entirely different names. Maybe I want first name and last name, but it says surname in the database, and I want to do those kinds of, of mappings. And it's significant to point out that, we'll see this a little bit later why this is important, that these are all set up as partial classes. So I've got a partial class, because this is generated. And in the past, when we go and do this kind of stuff, we wouldn't have, we didn't have partial classes, so we would just have like abstract Northman data context. And the only way that you could extend this is through derivation. But you didn't really intend to derive, you just really wanted to extend. You wanted to say, hey, generated code, you're cool, except I want one additional thing. And then you got into this uncomfortable proliferation of classes. With, with the generated code using partials a lot, saying this is just part of the Northwind data context, the other part's going to be over here. That will allow us to make changes to this class and put them in another file. And why that's cool is that if I go and edit my DBML file again, make changes to it, I'm not going to go and destroy any code that I've typed in here. Because I shouldn't be typing code in here because this code was generated by a tool, me. Now, partial methods are even freakier. Who's using partial methods? No? Partial methods, a little bit? They're kind of weird, aren't they? Partial methods are uh, kind of philosophical. <coughs> Again, think about extension. If I'm saying that there's all these methods, but you notice that there's no body to any of those methods. We're not actually indicating what insert category does. We're just kind of saying, you know, what if there were a thing called insert category? Wouldn't that be nice? That's what that says. That's the partial password. If there was one, that'd be cool. Now, in the old days, this would be a bunch of virtuals, right? And I would then override them. And then I would have this derived class. And every time I wanted to see uh, if one of these was, uh, was available, I would have to pay for that, that kind of virtual table lookup thing, right? It's kind of complicated. Here I'm just saying, you know, you could have any of these, but if you don't want any of those, that's cool too. Okay? So these are actually going to act as events if I want. Because I can get things like really detailed, like on category ID changing, on category ID change. And we get information about these. This would ordinarily be kind of as events. But these are actually methods that are going to get called, but only if I choose to implement them. So if I go in another class and make um, the rest the other part of one of these methods that, that just exists in another class, that's going to get called. So that's kind of a cool way to do both extension of a class as well as you know, kind of eventing. You could have used events, could have done it in an OO way. So you know, kudos to Anders and folks for pulling off partial methods. It's pretty hot. All right, so the point is, I've got these objects, and they're, they're lying around. Now I'm going to say add new web adio.net data service. I'm going to say northwind.service. Forgive me. And we just got a new file here. We got this northwind.svc. Now that's just actually a text file. And you see that little plus sign there? That plus sign appears because I have that don't lie to me checkbox clicked. We open that up. Let's look at both of these. Inside of northwind.service, we've got this. It's just one line that says, you know, there's a service host. You ever make an ASHX file? You ever make one of those? And it's like an ASPX, but it's an ASHX. It's like a handler. This is just an endpoint. It's something to call. This isn't required, but this is just a way for us to have something on disk that we can point at. So when I say localhost slash northwind.sbs, the SPC rather, that it knows what to talk about. And it's saying that the service is going to be in web application 9.1. <coughs> so this file exists for no other reason other than to be something I can address. Okay? Now inside here, they put a to-do. Put your data source class name here. They're saying our new Northwind class we just made derives from data service. <coughs> and they want a data, they want a type there in that little template block in the angle brackets. 
Well, we made a north wind data context a minute ago. So I'm going to say that that is a north wind data context. And look at the namespace this lives in. So this is the new stuff. This is ADO.net data services. This used to be called Project Astoria. And this lives in system.data.services. This is just data specific services. It's not in system.web, which is kind of an interesting thing. It's always fun to see, kind of imagine them arguing about where these things are going to live when they put them in, in, uh, in different namespaces. Now they've got a bunch of to do's in here because there's a lot of different options. Remember how I said before that when you, you, know, when you show people something like data services, they assume it's going to be kind of the old style Microsoft where you push a button, click a checkbox, and your entire database is available via the web. And that would be extraordinarily bad. But we know that that's inverted now, and everything is off by default. So you get nothing by default. There's no, no uh, permissions to do anything. So you have to set a series of rules. Now I could go and say, you know, set access rule products. I could give us read, write, whatever. So here I'll just say all read. So I've explicitly given myself access to products, but only read access. And these can get really complicated. You can make them as complicated as, as you need. And there are also different interceptors and stuff, so these can be based on you know, permissions or whatever. Let's run this and see what's going on. So we're hitting that northwind.service here. Now remember how I set the port to 1325 just to make it well known. That northwind.service is that text file that we set up a second ago. And we get this service endpoint. And there are a couple interesting things going on here. First, it says workspace, and it says products is available. Now even though I pull over products and categories and customers and all that stuff, I can just see products because I explicitly said in the permissions I only want to allow access to the products. You can put in a star and get everything, but you're not supposed to do that. So we're just going to put in products and customers, categories, try that. See how each one of them can have different permissions. You can also <coughs> make procs, make sure procs available if you want to. So here I've got my three things available. So I've just changed permissions and now I've got these available. Okay. Now this is really significant. You see where it says href? This is where this kind of blew my mind a little bit and I finally got my head around it. It says href, like, like it's referring to something I could, could click on. But remember, we're not ever going to see these angle brackets. Machines are going to talk these. But what if I go and say categories? See my URL here? Slash categories? So, you guys use uh, like RSS, you guys subscribe to blogs and things like mm -hmm. that, feeds? Yep. You know how there's RSS, really simple syndication? And then there's Atom, which is an alternative syndication. It was kind of done as a, to RSS. <laughs> well, Atom was not meant just to syndicate blogs. It was meant to provide access to any kind of data. It was a formalization of moving data around in that style of REST. So, if I hadn't gone into IE and turned off show friendly feeds, you know, I would have got that, hey, it's a feed, it's a blog. This is a feed, it's an atom feed. It looks just like a blog as far as IE is concerned. Now IE wouldn't know what to show, so it would just say, hey, you want to subscribe? And it would show blank stuff. But I've turned that off by going into tools options. But it's significant to see that we've got an entry, just like a blog entry. <laughs> Let's close each of these up. So all my categories are appearing as entries, just as if I was looking at a blog. Now, that's the last time I'll try to say blog, because you have to think that this is a syndication format that is about data, not about blogs. So let's take a look at what's in what namespaces. All of these things are kind of in the default namespace, all author and link and all that. Those things are all in the Atom namespace. They're unchanged. But then we have this other namespace, this alternative namespace, this M colon and D colon. What are these? 
Well, M colon, look at the top in the red here, is ADO data services. That's Microsoft. And that's okay. You don't have to freak out if you see something like that. Oh, Microsoft changed something again. Adam was meant to be extended. But look at the default namespace. XML NS. That's a standard, the Atom Pub standard, which is cool. It's nice to see Microsoft doing standards. But M and D are the data services namespaces. So we're kind of mixing and matching here. So look at the ID of this category. Categories at six. That's an actual full URL. It's an identifier. It's not a database identifier. It's not a GUID. It's not, you know, category six or whatever's in the database. This is a URI in the truest sense of the word. It's saying, here's the ID for this category. So let's type that into the Okay, and here I just got just that one category. Make sense? And here's the content. So that's that's the object right there. See the picture? A little picture from the Northwind database of this category. Get all the base 64 encoded schmutz down there, sir. Is that a permalink or is that ID synthetic? Well, it's so, both. It's persistible. I mean, it's I mean, permanent if you don't move it, and it's synthetic in the sense that it was yeah. I mean, it was generated yeah, based as on opposed the, to map to a right. an ID so field you, in the so database. As, as the one person in the room who cares, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just you and I have a conversation. Uh, for for what you're doing, you know, pushing books around, you could choose to expose this to people. Okay. Or not. It's up to you. Yeah. But you could get really detailed where you might want to allow people to have arbitrary queries. Yeah. We, so, synth we synthesize actually permalinks because they need to be printed. Yeah. And we want to make sure they don't get muffled. Now, and that gets into how much of your database's physicality do you want to appear in the URL? Mm -hmm. And now, at, at, every, uh, at, every, uh, at every sentence, at every new bit of information that I share with you, is another opportunity for people to go, ugh. Oh, the database queries in the URL. Uh, bad, right? Uh, you know, I, permission to the database. I can talk to uh, every opportunity. Everything I say is one more way to say. Ah, uh, if it's not for you, that's cool in the gang. Don't wear the shoe. This is not, uh, you know, the only way to do stuff. Mm -hmm. But this is solving a very interesting problem, which is how do I get data from here to here as simple as possible? And you know, port 1433 or whatever SQL Server port is, is not always the easiest way. And TDS is not exactly a transparent format. Yeah. Sometimes I'd like to move information around the angle brackets. And <coughs> web services is a really hard way to move data around with angle brackets. Now, it's a very important way, if there are, th there are aspects about that, but REST serves a place. Now, interestingly, this is all built on top of WCF. This is all built on top of, of Indigo of the, the Communications Foundation. Now I can go and say categories slash description and drill down, get just that one. Okay. Or I could say, look at the URL here, slash description slash dollar sign value. And here I'm saying just give me that data without the angle brackets around it. Because I might just want to get that one bit of information. Isn't that cool? Yeah, you scalers. Care? All right, good. Now scalers, I, right? Now I, yeah, now I don't feel so bad. But the category can have, in this case, there is a thing called category ID. There is an actual thing in the database called category ID. So there is really a thing called one. So if five went away, this wouldn't be there anymore. But there's also the natural ID. So it might be category uh, parentheses quote and then a string. So you could actually ask for, you know, category beverages or whatever. So don't think that's just an ordinal. I mean, it is in the database, but it's not been generated by this system. It's been generated by the database. Okay, that's a very good question. That's like the primary key. Exactly. Yeah. Now, certainly, there are other keys you might want to use that would be a little friendlier. So I would probably encourage you to use more, more uh, natural keys. Now, here's products. So products under units, so we have units in stock, 39. We've got all these different products. Maybe I want to just see those products that have more than 100 units in stock. Mm. 
So this is a formalized addressing scheme. And if you look at the Astoria team's blog, you can learn about these different things. Here I'm saying dollar sign filter. I was saying dollar sign value before. And I'm saying units in stock greater than 100. Now, I've got spaces there in my URL. But if I hit enter, of course, those are going to turn into percent 20s. Because it's still got to be a valid URL. And now I've just got those entries that are units in stock over 100. Now, you shouldn't say, oh, well, now Microsoft's got me writing SQL in the query thing. That's going to be great. Good job, Microsoft. Sir? If you're exposing a stored procedure, is there a way of identifying what the primary key is? Or if you have a multiple column primary key, how does that, how does that work? So, so right now, there's two things to think about. There's the database. And then there's the thing that's sitting between a story and the database. So right now, link to SQL is fairly one-to-one uh, -one physical relationship. If I drag the foo story procedure over, I could rename it in the SQL, you know, in, the, in the link to SQL designer, and say I want to call it bar. And that's you know that's kind of about it. If you want complicated mappings and you want to have you know a, an entirely different set of entities, then you want the entity framework, which sits on top of this stuff. So you get your database, then you say, well, I want one-to-one, -one, pretty physical mapping, basic stuff, link to SQL. Or I've got a you know, full-on enterprise database, and I want a, you know, an object relational mapper. This thing, Astoria, ADO.net Data Services, will sit on top of either one of those things. So I've got my service. I've got some data out there. I've given permission to some aspects of things. How do I, how do I get a hold of this data now? Okay. Let's find out. So let's go and say, let's shut this down, and we'll add a new... Uh, console application. Because not only are you always talking to Northwind in your, in your businesses, but clearly you're making console apps just left and right. <laughs> and let's go and add a reference to uh, the data.services client. 2008 versions of this IDE and it still takes a long time to bring up this guy. All right. So the, the structure of that data, and you know how in web services you, you've got your, you get your database, you pull your data out, and you put it into some described um, format that you may have made with schema, you may have made with objects. You shove it across the wire in, in angle brackets, and on the other side, someone else is expected to consume it. Now, in most Microsoft demos, they usually say, uh, you know, add reference, and then a miracle happens, and then you've got a magical series of these objects that look just like the ones on the server side. And there's no explanation about really what happened. So there's a little bit more flexibility with this, with this model. I'm going to cheat to save time for you guys, and I'm going to pull in one class and then explain what's going on. So here, we've got a console application. This is going to be the client. So this thing, this console app, is going to go and call that service. Okay. Now, think about this. All I know about that service is the URLs. That's all I know about it. Uh, and what I've been able to glean from poking around in, you know, in, in my debugger, i.e. So I can see that products have a product ID and a product name and units in stock. And I go and call this a, an open object. I'm going to say that anything else that you have that doesn't fit in there, shove in that dictionary at the bottom there. Okay. This is one of the big issues around serialization of these kinds of things, is where do you put the other crap? So in this case, we're putting all that crap in a uh, property bag. Add a using statement here. Open object lives in that. So that attribute is saying all the other crap goes down here in this, in property bag. This is just one example. I'll show you another way to do this in a second. Okay. Now, where did this object come from? I made it up. <coughs> I decided that this was what was valuable to me, and I wrote it myself. So I could totally do that. This could be in any language. Now we'll come out here, and we will say, uh, oops, data service context. We'll make a new data service context, and it wants a URI. Right? It wants that URI. So I'm going to say new URI, 
quote HTTP colon slash slash localhost, and I, for the purposes of debugging, we put it on 1325, right? Uh, and we'll say northwind.service. <coughs> now, that context, I can't get it to zoom. There we go. Getting car sick here. Stop it. There's nothing in here about products, right? I mean, there's no way that the IDE just magically understood what was going on there. I've just got this generic data service context. I've got this method called create query. Now, I don't need to be a .NET client. I could be anything that can consume angle brackets. So one of the benefits is that even at this point, before we've done anything inside of the console, we've already got a system that I can pull data out of. I mean, any Java folks, people who maybe weren't always .NET, people doing work in other languages, could immediately see, oh, I could totally get data from the database fairly straightforward way, and I could pull it into a DOM, and that would be cool. So I assume you can see the value of that for some scenarios immediately. So now we're looking at how there are alternative ways to get at that data in a more friendly way. Do you have a question? OK, you're just nodding? I, I like this guy. He's <laughs> nodding. All right, context, dot. So we're going to create a query. And we're going to say, I'm going to create a query that's going to return products referring to this product. This is really important. I'm referring to this product here. I'm the client. I don't, I don't know anything about those products over there. Whatever he did to make products and bring them back as angle brackets, I don't know. But I'm saying I'm going to create a query that's going to return products, the products that I know about in my little public class down here. Let's get this wrong. Product. Now here it's saying relative URL. Remember how the Northwind service gave us that list of URLs, product, category, the ones that I allowed to be uh, accessed. So I'm going to say products is the relative URL that I'm going to be using. I'm going to say where p dot. Making a link query here. Where does that IntelliSense come from? P dot. From here, we don't know anything about the server, right? We haven't made any calls to the server yet. Okay, we're P dot units in stock. Put that down here. Greater than 100, we'll get a bunch of P's out of there. And let's put a breakpoint here. See if this works. So we have two lines here. Make a new data service context. Let me get this query back. Now, that's a link query. Oh, I forgot to make that my, my startup application. Okay, so we break point. Everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. Hover over query, it's null. All right? Now, when I hit step over, what do you expect you're going to see there? Mm -hmm. Throw it out, just guess. He thinks a bunch of angle brackets. What do you think? A bunch of angle brackets? No, it's innumerable. No, no. It's an innumerable. Oh, it's Hang on now. It's definitely innumerable. Can't, I can't get that to zoom in. These stupid tool tips, I tell you. Yeah, it won't work. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, buddy. Yes, it will. Okay. We made a query. We didn't make an I enumerable anything. We didn't make a list of anything. We just described the query. This is really interesting. Remember how I was saying earlier, how am I going to write these? Yeah, Microsoft, make me write it in the No. You describe it, in this case using link. And the client side library is creating that query for me. Just like link to SQL is link to SQL, we have basically link to, to REST. So that query, as funky as it is, got created here on the client side. Now, if I wanted to make an application that limited people, I could certainly you know, hard code these and limit them in any way that I want to. But I'm, by making a link query like that, I'm effectively hard coding them. I'm just letting someone else do the generation work. Have I actually done the query yet? No. 
And this is one of the things that is kind of confusing a lot of people about, uh, about Link and, 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 and things like that, are that uh, when does this happen? When does the actual querying happen? Because there's just enough magic to make you a little bit uncomfortable. Right there. There we go. Okay. So the query happened when I started enumerating over that stuff that first time. That's when that actually happened. Now, this is one way to have proven that. But a more interesting way would be to go and run something like TCP trace. And I'm going to say, because this is local host, I'm not going to hook up, uh, I can't hook up some kind of packet sniffer because we're not really on the wire here, we're just doing local host, right? Pocketsoap.com, fantastic. thing was written like 10 years ago, and it still works. Uh, wasn't that crazy? Software that actually works a few years after it came out. So I'm going to say port 8080 forwards to port 1325. Okay. And that, that's all. And then we'll go back here. You're trying to do something. Except or not. Except or not. All right. So we'll change this to 88. And it's going to get forwarded. All right? So here we see the get. We see. The user agent, ADO Data Services, this is really significant. Look at the accept colon line. This is an HTTP header that's saying, I accept Adam and regular XML. We're going to need that later. Let's think about that. Then here, we see our HTTP headers. And then our feed comes back. Yay, cool. Now, I can go through my uh, whole application here. And it works? Cool. Why was that accept header significant? Yep. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, thank you, sir. Good idea. He's saying, let's look at the property bag. Thank you for keeping me on task. I appreciate it. So what's in the property bit? Everything else. Cool? Does that help? All right. So the contract between us is fairly loose here, right? And, and that's just kind of a common thing in a, in a world where you've got the structured data coming back and you've got to map it into the CLR place. At some point, you're going to have to say, and here's the overflow. You know, it's not exactly pretty, but eh, what are you going to do? It's cool. So that's one way to do it. And is there a way to infer the, to know the types that's coming across the wire? So, for instance, when you looked at the bag, you had some ID that was 25. That could be an int or a long or... Sure. Let's find out. Macro long or... Is that what you want? Okay. Those are your data types. But there's more information... Well, what's coming. EDM? Is that the, the Microsoft? That's the Microsoft thing. You know, yeah, so data it's well-published as... Yeah, it's, my, it's, it's the databases. In, it's, it's what the database thinks a decimal is, okay. which may be different from what your client side type is. Yeah. There's, not, there's nothing CLR ish in here. This yeah, so basically focus. you have to examine this before you make your own classes by hand because there, there's no yeah. glue that's generating it for you. Exactly. I mean, that's it. One of the things I like to do in my demos, and one of the things I'm trying to encourage people at Microsoft to do, is to not go and then, and, and, and magic happens. Yeah. So this is why this, this presentation is designed yeah. the way it is. It's because I'm trying to show you that there's nothing else going on here. I mean, yeah. we were just in a basically a packet sniffer. Yeah. You know, if there was something below that that was going on to make all this work, that would be evil of me. <laughs> and I've only been at Microsoft six months. Uh, I don't get evil for at least uh, another six months. So. Schedule. You're <laughs> yeah. off your schedule. Exactly. Okay. All right. So let's do this. 
I, I don't have to go to the command line, but I just want to make sure that's really clear what's going on here. I'm going to call data service util. You guys have used like wisdle.exe. This would be the, the kind of the data services equivalent of that. I'm going to say, hey, generate some classes, and here is the URI. Notice that I'm using 8080 again. So we're going to be pushing this through our little packet deal. And I'm pointing it at northwind.service. And I'm going to say, give me foo.cs. I didn't need that quotation at the end there. So here I just did something. What happened? Well, a call just came through my little packet sent for deal here. And it asked for dollar sign metadata. We've seen this dollar sign format before. So here's more information about like, what you would want. Exactly. That's, that's the description of the entities. Now, this is the description of the entities as they are as I handed them to data services, which could have been linked to SQL, it could have been linked to entities. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if we have more time, I have a demo of using a thing called nHibernate, mm -hmm. which is an open source object relational mapper, and I've got almost working this, okay. Astoria, over nHibernate. Mm -hmm. And that's not like supported scenario da, 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 yet. Sure. But the idea is, if you have an I queryable, mm -hmm. or an I ordered queryable, you should be able to do this. The problem is you have to come up with a, uh, the link projections that are correct. Because link is handing you this abstract syntax tree that's describing, and I have to turn it into whatever format my underlying system understands. That is a non-trivial task. Uh, but it's possible. And I'm a biscuit away from, from getting to work. Okay? Standard unit measurement biscuit. Yeah. yeah, it's a biscuit. All right, so now I've got foo.cs. Let's do this. Let's go back over here. Let's go ahead and take our prop, our product and get rid of it. Let's go and add that foo.cs that we've got. The one that we generated. Let's look at what's going on in there. And I'll put it in the same namespace. So we generated a Northwind data context. And it takes a URI. It's got on created and all those kind of cool things that we saw from that earlier context. So a, a .NET client of your service could just do this. And just like web services. And they get the data automatically. Mm -hmm. But the reason that I showed you that first way first, because you don't have to do this. Right? Now you technically didn't have to do this either with web services when you go and say, you know, file, uh, add, web reference. But a lot of magic happened when we did that, right? When you run wisdle.exe, writing your, you know, writing your own manual SOAP stack is, is a little more of a problem. Mm -hmm. This is really transparent. So I wanted to show you how easy it was to write your own object. Here we get the generated one. It's a little bit more complicated. It's got some cool stuff, though. Like you see this here. Does that line look familiar? Mm -hmm. So that's hidden for me. So now I go back over here, and I can say Northwind data context. Pass in the same URI. And then here I can say products. And it still works. Okay? Pretty basic stuff, but what have we done? We just made it that much more friendly. Mm -hmm. We've made this cleaner. We made that cleaner. So we don't have that manual kind of uh, late bound create query. It's buried now. Because what, what, what's the uh, what's the um, the old adage that uh, any sufficiently deep layer of abstraction is indistinguishable from magic? <laughs> Mr. Clark. It's underneath there. It's still there, but it's hidden. And certainly you could write these yourself as well. Okay. Now, remember the accept stuff that we were talking about earlier. Remember this. All right? As the client, we announced ahead of time the list of things we would accept. This is something browsers do now. When you have a browser, uh, that supports like GIF or PNG, 
you, you can use the same tool to look at what your browser is doing, and you can see that your browser announces lots of things about itself when it asks for something. It says, hey, I support GIF and PNG, or if it doesn't support PNG, it doesn't say so. I think it's funny when you visit a website and they have a picture of like two flags, and you're supposed to click on the flag of your country, when your browser is announcing the language that it speaks already, and it's saying, I speak English and Spanish and Chinese. It says that every single, every, everything it asks for, it asks for one pixel GIF, it says, hey, I speak Chinese. Giving the person on the other side, on the side of the resource, the opportunity to say, here's a Chinese one pixel GIF, or whatever, right? That, there's all this context that we did, as web application developers, we don't ask for. Uh, in, in, in the example of localization, your browser says, I speak Chinese, you could bring back the Microsoft logo in Chinese, if you went to the effort of doing that, but we don't, we just slap a GIF on the disk and then it comes back. So what the guy who uh, came up with REST for his PhD thesis, the, the guy who came up with this whole idea for REST, and then Microsoft, of course, implemented their vision of REST, uh, is doing is saying that HTTP as a protocol is cool. That's what REST is. It's a declaration of, let's not layer one more thing on top of HTTP. And there's a belief that things like XML, RPC, and SOAP, SOAP being simple object access protocol is not really simple and doesn't really access objects, <laughs> <laughs> is putting a bunch of stuff, a bunch of verbs, and a bunch of addressing schemes on top of a protocol that already had that. We have our uh, get, put, post, delete. And we have our addressing scheme. And we have things like, hey, I accept Adam. So what can we do with that? What can I do with this accept Adam concept? Let's go and make, uh, let's call, let's, you, guys, you, you guys ever use Fiddler? Yeah. Fiddler's a great tool. It lets you fiddle with HTTP traffic. And let's go and uh, make one of these queries again. I'll grab one out of my address bar here. I'll grab uh, that one. So I just, in Fiddler, just came over here to the request builder and then just typed in the URL giving me products with units of stock greater than 100. And I can go and say, show me that. And there's my text, right? So even though the user agent wasn't Microsoft, it was somebody else, it still worked, right? You didn't have to fake that you were Microsoft making this phone. User agent Fiddler. So decidedly not IE or Firefox. It's just saying, hey, it's me Fiddler. What if we go and do this? Okay, so if you were paying attention, your brain just exploded. <laughs> if not, I'm doing a very poor job at my talk. So this is the exact same data expressed as JSON. So you should be thinking, I could use this back at the office when we upgrade to 2008. <laughs> so we've got a simple URL addressing scheme. We've got a straightforward security model on the back end. We've got an easy way to say, I want my data either with angle brackets or without angle brackets. Wouldn't that make an AJAX call just a lot easier in a rich application? And it's lightweight on the wire. Lightweight on the wire. Now I don't have to write that custom HTTP handler to go and go left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand, and go and find a JSON serializer, da 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 da. And this again uses WCF. So we're using the JSON serializer that's built into WCF. So that's hot, whether you think so or not. He likes it though. I that do. makes me happy. Mm. All right. How much time do I have? 15. 15 minutes. All right. Any questions about this before I show you something else? No? Sir. <coughs> yeah, so authentication, because this uses WCF, you can pretty much do whatever they'll allow you to, to do. So you can do basic auth, you can put this over SSL, you could potentially put in different message syncs and have a handshaking process or whatnot. It's kind of up, up to the limit of your ability to fool with the stack. But if you want to email me uh, specifically what your needs are, we can get that answer for you and I'll blog about it. Any other questions? So I'm really stoked about this. And I just want to make it really clear again that this is about choice. And I know that choice is a little freaky from, from Microsoft because uh, I always went to Microsoft as a, as a vendor you know, for 15 years on the outside and say, just tell me how to do it. 
and I'm realizing now, it seems like an obvious thing to say, maybe a silly thing to say, you know, that uh, having more choices is better, and not everything that they give me is perfect. And this answers this one question that we've seen, how to easily access data over HTTP in a way that kind of fully embraces all the stuff that HTTP has to offer. This is good for AJAX scenarios, it's good for rich client scenarios that go over uh, HTTP and go over maybe port 80 or a port that you control and uh, very, very quick, easy access to your data. Okay? So let's look at a few other things. Any more questions on this? Because i gotta, I got 15 minutes to talk about this other thing. All right, cool. All right, so one of the other things that was within this ASP.NET 3.5 extensions, this kind of new stuff, was called dynamic data. And one of the one of the jokes that, that, that Phil and I, Phil Hack, the PM for NBC, who'll be doing a talk on the model view controller framework, uh, we usually say during our talk on NBC is we say that about five percent of people using ASP.NET will care about NBC. It's another example of choice, and it's freaking people out because NBC is coming out and everyone's like, oh crap. All this work I've done learning web forms and now I gotta throw that out and I gotta learn this new thing. But you know, it's a, it's a choice, it's a lightweight choice, and about 5% of you will care. But for most of you doing line of business, data grid type stuff, you won't. You're not gonna care. So what's the other 95% gonna care about? So dynamic data is a, a series of controls that are added to ASP.NET, to the grid view and the details view, and uh, kind of a new um, a paradigm shift on the part of Microsoft, because they're starting to embrace what's called convention over configuration. And this is one of the things that the Rails guys, the Windows guys, always say convention over configuration. Rather than saying, uh, you know, here's where our themes folder is, and if you want to change it, you can go in and make this obscure, overridden key in the web config to make it called foo instead of themes, which is a typical Microsoft thing to do. Uh, they just say, the folder's called themes, get over it. You can't change it, it's conventional. If everyone has a folder called themes, then everyone will know where their themes are. That's the idea on convention or configuration. You first saw a hint of that at Microsoft when ASP.NET 2.0 came out and all those app underscore folders appeared, right? People were freaking out. App underscore code? That's BS. That's going to ruin my application. I already had one called app underscore code, which is BS. But as Microsoft people, we're used to having the option to change these names, okay? But once you kind of just let that flow over you and accept that convention over configuration in some instances can be good, then you can do a lot of stuff. So a lot of the things that we're going to be showing you here aren't magic, but are rather conventional. This is named this way because it is the convention. And if you like it, great. If you don't, sorry. Tough tooties, as my mom said. So let's look at an application that is a talk to an address, an address book. It's not Northland yet, although I'll show you the Northland demo later. So this is just meant to be kind of a you know fairly complicated example of the kind of stuff that we write uh, all the time. <coughs> this is the original uh, address book, and this is using uh, we have data grid. So I'll make this a little bigger, and I can you know select names, see the data over here. Again, really advanced UI work that I've been doing here. I can go and edit somebody. I can add a new person. If I hit insert, there's validation. Right. We do this stuff all freaking day long, right? Except for the validation part, who does that, right? Uh, and, and, and this is just the bane of my existence. I hate this crap. We're always slogging through this stuff. And then what if you want to say, you know, we just found this awesome new text box. Kicks ass, new text box. It does only phone numbers. All right, which one of us wants to volunteer to be the guy who goes and does all the text boxes and changes them over to a phone number text box, right? Or, oh, we just found Peter Blum's validation and more application. We're gonna go put new validators on everything. Or make sure all integer validators, you know, all integer boxes have this format. And then you gotta go and add them everywhere, right? That's the kind of just crap work that we keep finding ourselves doing. T -t Tell me that you do this work, yeah? Okay, people are nodding. And we just do it. I mean, it's just moving, it's just moving the mouse work. It's, it's monkey work, and I hate it. So uh, here is the address book. Let's just take a look at this. We've got a table inside of a form. We have a list view. We've got link buttons and labels. 
different eval statements. We're going to do some data binding. Get everyone pretty familiar with what's going on here, right? We've got our link button for inserts. Scroll down. We've got our details view. Remember the whole template stuff, like there's edit templates, which is the make it look like this when we're editing. And then there's the item template, which is the make it look like this when we're not editing. So when we're showing a category, we show a label. When we're editing, we show a drop down list. Or whatever. It's pretty blah kind of stuff. Here's another good first name, text box, and validator, the one that no one ever uses. Living inside of the edit item template. And on and on. Here's a details view. And on and on and on. It's not that complicated of an application. That's a pretty obscene amount of work, in my opinion. So what the dynamic data guys are doing is extending ASP.NET. Okay, so I just want to make it really clear. These are some new controls. Things in the live in grid view, in the live in details view. Uh, the control that you really care about is called dynamic control. And it's going to make this page simpler. Now, again, I'm talking, uh, well, we're really going to have to delete this when we're done, because uh, this is not the way the messaging usually goes. But I mean, when, when I hear things like, oh, it's called dynamic control, you know, don't you just expect the Microsoft guy to go and say, well, hey, in my one bedroom apartment, placing tiny little ads, newspapers all across the country, and I go, dynamic control, but hey, and it's a full application. <laughs> don't you want this? Right? Because you know that Microsoft guy's going to do that. He's going to go file new enterprise, hit OK, and generate your whole app, and he wants to know why you're not happy with what he just did. <laughs> so when I first heard about dynamic data, I was just like, oh, man, don't auto generate more crap for me that I can't modify later. So I was like, yeah, for these guys for about a month, two months. I, did not, I, I didn't pay attention. I finally sat down with the guys and got an understanding of what they were doing. And I finally realized that this was what I was looking for. So remember we saw that chunk of code before, labels, drop downs, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Here we've got dynamic control. Okay. So it's not that it replaced the whole page, we're just talking about one control here. We've got dynamic control with the data field right here. So then again, typical Microsoft thing would be and take, and that's it. Yay. But what's really happening underneath is where this gets powerful. So the, the code for our address book is another, is another link to SQL. Could be linked to entities, doesn't matter. And remember how we were talking about this notion of partial classes. But I don't want to mess with that generated code, but sometimes I want to do some annotations, I want to add some information, I want to put it in another class. So here we're going to say, here's the rest of, of contact. It's over here in this other file. But I don't want to really sully this. I don't want to mess this up because people have classes uh, that, that live a certain way and they don't want them messed with. They don't want you to have to go and decorate them. So there's a layer of indirection to say, well, here's the metadata that you're going to need to know. You, the UI. So here's contract metadata. And these are saying for website, for birthday, for email address, here's some information that you might want to know. At the data model level, here's a custom attribute. This is an email. That's a custom type. That doesn't, that's not a type that we know about, right? This is a URL. Look at this one for birthday. Saying, I want it formatted this way. So we're moving that format stuff that usually exists on 10 different pages within your application and repeated over and over again, and we're moving it into a metadata class. It's part of the model. This is another thing that, the, uh, that more the people on the web are trying to think about. This is called keeping it dry. <coughs> Don't repeat yourself. That's what dry means. So next time you have a code review in your office, you say, is that dry? Because if you see that they've got the same formats during 16 different times, Figure out a way to get that out of that. Keep it dry. So what can we do with this information? Here's where the convention over configuration stuff gets really interesting. There's a new folder 
And this new folder is only for dynamic data applications. So this isn't something you have to use. It's something that you'll use if it makes you happy. This folder has to be there, and that's the name of it. And inside that folder is a web.config file that disallows all access to the folder. So this is not something that anyone could ever get to. Okay? We've got four folders here. Content, custom pages, field templates, and page templates. Well, take a look at this. Very cool. Custom controls everything. Data type dot ACX or data type underscore state, in this case edit dot ACX. So let's look at uh, text edit. So when you are showing a text box and the data type is this and you're in the state called edit, show these. Yep. One location. He's smiling. I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> We should talk later. We should hang out. Yeah, it's a, la it's a lack of brainstorms. <laughs> collect the check after Thursday. <laughs> now, page templates. <laughs> templates for details, templates for edit and insert. So if you want to change the text box to use, you know, Telerik or Infragistics or Component One or whoever makes you happy, you do it in one place. I'm going to change the validator to do it in one place. Let's look at let's look at a more complicated example. If only there were a database, a conveniently publicly accessible database with products and categories that I could possibly use. What could it be? Oh, here's one. So I've got down here different controls. So here I'm saying I want to use the Teleric control for integers or for text boxes. So here, when I'm listing out books in this example, I can give myself UI hints. And that UI hint is just a text that I can give myself that passes along. So here I'm saying publish date. You know, I want that one to use the Teleric date time. Not all the date times are going to be that one. I just want this particular kind of object. When that gets shown anywhere, I want it to be done with that control. And then I want the text box down here to be done with Teleric as well. And then, you know, I want to go ahead and add a, a range for validation. So here, look at quantity. We've got a range of 0 to 100 with the error message sitting right there in the metadata. Certainly that could be done at the internationalization as well. So then later, this is our edit box ASCX page. How much time do we have? Negative five minutes? Like negative five minutes, seriously? Okay. So on the page load of just this one control, when it comes time to show the Teleric edit box, I just go and take grab me out that metadata, and then I take the metadata off the domain object and shove it into the validator. And again, this code is written once. Does that make sense? All right, let me show you this, and I'll show you one last thing, and then we'll, we'll be done. There's like eight hours of good stuff I can show you, but I'm just uh, limited, I guess. So here we've got the books, and hit edit. So I've got custom, com custom calendar from another company, and I've got custom fancy text box thing out at the bottom. So if you had all of these different controls available to you, what could, what could one do? I just said file new dynamic website. The new website type. Okay? And I'm just going to very briefly go new item, add my link to SQL, just like we did before. Sorry, got to do Northwind because I'm running out of time here. Grab some stuff categories, products, shippers, suppliers, whatever, blah, 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 blah. 
save, and we know we have a north wind data context at this point. Now I'm going to go in here, my global ASA, I'm going to comment this line out. You see where it says type of? I'm going to put in north wind data context. Cool. See where it says scaffold all tables? True. Hit F5. Bam. Paging, editing, selection. So this is that horrible demo that Microsoft guys always show. But the cool part of this demo is that I could go into any of these things. Like look at this here. See where it says grid view pager? And go in there. Okay. <clears throat> So it's one thing to show, hey, look, it just generated your whole admin application. But it's another to say, and you can change any aspect of it that you want. So that's cool. Excellent. And it didn't generate, this is really important, because it hasn't gone and generated products pages and categories pages, because all that metadata is available to us. What's it done? Well, it's given us this format over here on the side. None of those pages exist. And it's using the routing, just the routing, from the MVC framework mm -hmm. that you can go and learn about when you talk. You see Phil's talk in a couple of uh, sessions from now. So here it's going to go and say table, list details, and get, get you automatically into that. And you can edit the routing too. So you could say, well, I want books to go over here, and everything else can go there. This is why routing was pulled out of MVC, because it's useful in non-MVC related contexts. So this stuff is going to be all available in the next little while uh, in, in, a, in a, some unreleased, unnamed update. But it will be a standard thing. You won't have to go hunting for it. This is going to extend the grid view and the details view. And then the uh, same thing with the Astoria uh, stuff, which is the AEO.net data services. And uh, I'm way over time at this point. Thanks for your patience. And if you want to email me, please do. Scott H.A. at Microsoft. Uh, er, please visit my blog. Please subscribe at Hanselman.com. I've also got a podcast. If you go up on iTunes or on Zoom.